you know, things pop up as you're going through this, you found something else. Yeah, that, that Robert Mueller's team investigated one of the more salacious claims in the dossier about whether, uh, the dossier, I should say, whether there was a compromising tape of President Trump in Moscow from 2013 during the Miss Universe pageant and whether the president knew about its rumored existence during the campaign. And according to the report, in October of 2016, prior to the election, Michael Cohen, the president's former lawyer and fixer, received a text message from a Russian businessman who texted to him, quote, stopped flow of tapes from Russia, but not sure if there's anything else, just so you know, dot, dot, dot. The special counsel interviewed this Russian businessman, and he told the special counsel that these tapes referred to compromising tapes of Trump rumored to be held by persons associated with real estate uh, that helped host the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. Cohen, according to this report, told the special counsel that after he received this text message from the Russian businessman, he told Trump about it, so candidate Trump at that time, about this, and that the, the businessman told prosecutors that the tapes ended up being fake, but that he never conveyed that to Michael Cohen, and therefore that was never conveyed uh, to Trump. And so here you have a scenario where Trump was told in October of 2016 that there might be compromising, compromising tapes of him um, that are held by Russians. And then he's briefed by his own FBI director in January of 2017 about the dossier and that the Russians uh, may have compromising tapes about him involving his conduct when he was a private citizen during the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. Mm. So that seems significant. And, and, and you know, you, you put that in the context of the president's behavior and so forth with this belief, potential belief that there were these compromising tapes of him that he has always denied. And we should point out, should as point you said, out. the Russian businessman said that the tapes were fake. They were fake. Yes, he was, to reiterate that he, was, that. he was told that he was told, told the tapes Yes, were fake. he was told that yeah. that specific. He was told the tapes were fake, yeah. but that was never conveyed to Cohen. For those following at home, that's volume two, page 27, <laughs> footnote 112. <laughs> footnote 112. Jake, how many people do you think are actually sitting at home <laughs> with this 400 no page document and being like, oh, wait, let me. <laughs> uh, I mean, turn to that fellow nerds out there. Well, but, but actually, you know, the the version that was down, that was put on the on the web is not searchable, and yeah. there is a big See? industry now of I'm people. You are. Oh, well, there are there are lots of folks um, using technical skills that are greater than mine who are putting it out on the web now in searchable format. Mm. I suspect, but, but by the, the way, original one was not. And I suspect, by the way, don't you, Pamela, that, that the reason this isn't a footnote is because they want to de-emphasize it. They want they, they don't want people Absolutely. running want around people thinking, oh my God, the tape that. is real, the tape is real. Exactly. It's, it's they a, have it's no a, reason to believe, according it, yeah. to this footnote, that this that this tape it is was real, told the tapes that it's were valid. Fake. They investigated yeah. it. And in fact, we're now learning that uh, Michael Cohen was told about a tape the Russians may have, but this person who conveyed that to Cohen during the campaign then told prosecutors he was told the tapes were fake. And as we know, the president has always denied this um, from the get-go. But what's interesting in, in this context is just the idea that the president was told this as a candidate, that, the, that this, uh, this rumored existence of these compromising tapes, and then he was briefed about it in January of 2017 by the FBI director talking about uh, the dossier, so it just gives more context to all of also that. Also gives you a sense of the portfolio of Michael Cohen in the Trump organization dealing with, you know, Russian businessmen and tapes. Yeah, well, and also just the, the idea that this, uh, apparent, apparently President Trump first learned about this apparently false allegation uh, when, a, when the Russian businessman uh, texted Cohen. In October not, 2016. Yeah, in October 2016, right. not from later on, as he would find That's out. That's what from, I'm saying, yeah. So, he, so, he so found he'd out, already so been then, told about then it. he hears yeah. from his FBI director what he was told by Michael Cohen a few months earlier about these alleged compromising tapes that, again, we have no reason to believe actually exist. But it goes towards the state of mind. I mean, that's part of this whole issue here. You're talking about, especially with obstruction and the vested interest that this president would have to try to undermine it or try to influence or just say, you know, this has been a cloud over my presidency. Remember, he spoke to um, two Russians who came to the White House and said, I got rid of, what, that nut job Comey because I had this cloud of the Russia conspiracy or collusion overhead. This speaks to it, which leads you to understand, what, and earlier, I think you may have reported on it, Pam, earlier, the idea that one of the reasons why they opted not to pursue the subpoena to actually get Donald Trump to testify to them in person, as opposed to the take home examination, was because they had substantial information outside of that to be able to assess 
and evaluate the president's motivations and his interests at that point in time. That was probably one of the ideas about how the contextual and, um, and circumstantial evidence surrounding how you form what somebody's intent would have been without them actually saying it. You have a president who believed somehow that there was going to be, aside from his drawing of a red line on finances, entree into his entire existence as candidate, as man, and now as the president of the United States. Yes. It doesn't quite add up, though, on the obstruction piece, because on one hand, again, you know, what I've seen so far in the report, what you're saying is, is, is that the special counsel says that we uh, were not able to put together mm -hmm. a case of obstruction. We didn't, but we didn't see, seek the subpoena because we thought we had enough evidence to make a determination but then they didn't make the determination. Right. So there still is a, a, a piece of this that even though the special counsel's report explains somewhat of what they did with the obstruction, I still don't feel, and, and maybe when I read more details, I will feel more confident in understanding exactly why the special counsel's office didn't make but, its determination, unless it was because they were simply providing the facts. M Mueller Congress. also says in the report that another reason why they didn't seek out Donald Trump's testimony was that the, the legal delay mm -hmm. would have just eaten up months right. mm -hmm. that they didn't, they didn't feel that they have. So it wasn't just So they just would have had they, to weigh it, yeah, but they were weighing the delay, which... Which is very subjective, I think, that analysis. I don't know what you guys think, but I, I mean, think that's subjective. Months. <laughs> it, it, it could have taken longer or it could have been expedited. Courts could have handled it in different ways given the gravity of the matter. So I feel like that piece but is, it is important to point out subjective that judgment. The Mueller report is saying the president's answers were inadequate. Those were solely answers on the issue of conspiracy or collusion. Mm -hmm. Nothing about, the, you know, he refused to do even written answers on obstruction of justice, which is obviously a more fraught area, uh, clearly, given what right. Mueller had found. I, I really read that as meaning, I, mean, I don't know what the other prosecutors think, but I read that as them feeling like we've got him mm -hmm. in terms of the intent evidence. We don't need to interview him. Now, the decision, Right, they said his, that his personal, right. that his public statements and other stuff right. that already gave them an, ide a, 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 an <laughs> idea of what was going on. Yeah, I think it was a closed book on whether he intended that or not. It's a separate question. Do you decide to indict or you follow the policy? But in terms of evidence, I'd look at that as saying, I don't need to interview the guy. I already got him. Mm. And they said that. They said, we had sufficient evidence to understand relevant events and to make certain assessments without the president's testimony, almost rendering it obsolete. Now, of course, I don't see it as obsolete. I, I'd want to be able to yeah. ask the follow-up yeah. questions and after it's vetted by the lawyers and you have your necessary preface about your amnesia that you're supposed to have whenever a lawyer talks to you. <laughs> um, but I can't recall this exact fact you're talking about. Well, then I want to follow up and say, oh, well, do you, do you want to follow up on the receipts that you've actually talked about these issues? Let me refresh recollection in some way. So you're right. The idea that he didn't have to answer questions about this. And I agree with you in an assessment that they thought, well, I don't need this. But for the legal issue here of, yep. look, we're precluded from being able to pursue anything. So, again, I'm teeing it up for Congress. Here you go. Hmm. Yeah.